continue with our series, Money, Sex, and Power. And now we're getting to the, uh, the part that's a little more uh, provocative, I guess you want to call it. It's the sex part. And what are you doing here? PG-13. Okay. Well, I guess they're going to have a lot of questions after the service today. <laughs> All right. Well, that's okay. You guys are going to hear about it anyhow. So anyhow, uh, we're talking about sex today and what the proper role of sex is in our culture, in our church life, and how we live. And make no mistake about it, you know, the three things that often get people into trouble is money, sex, and power. And all those three things, nothing wrong with money, there's nothing wrong with sex, there's nothing wrong with power, put in the proper context. But the abuse of those three cause wars, divorces, trouble, um, church splits, relationships go bad. Think about it. Any kind of conflict you have, think about it. It's usually one of those three or a combination, isn't it? And perhaps one of the deepest areas that causes trouble is the area of sex in the wrong context. And sex in the wrong context, according to the Bible, is sex out of marriage. And so we'll be talking about that today. And uh, good, my wife's here to rescue me. Uh, hey, honey. We got the kids here. Is it okay to listen to this? <laughs> okay, all right. We're going to have a busy day today. Hallelujah. All right. We're a, little, we have, we're a little more loose in this service so we can get away with stuff. If you can turn your Bibles, please, to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to be going through what the Bible has to say. And today's title is this, it's just sex, what's the big deal? It's just sex, what's the big deal? You hear that all today, hey man, it's just sex, big deal. And today we're going to talk about why sexual sins are worse than other sins. Is it because the church doesn't want people having fun? Is that what it's about? Why is it worse? We're going to look at that today. And another thing is, a lot of people are afraid to talk about this issue. They have been in the past, when I was growing up, for example, when I was getting, a little, getting of age, uh, back in the 1970s, <laughs> uh, you know, it was uncomfortable for my mom and dad to talk about this with me when I was getting my, in my early years of teenager. So they hand me a book, read this, and they didn't want to discuss it too much. But unfortunately, they did a good job raising me. But unfortunately, I learned most of my stuff from the schoolyard. And boy, were they off right? And I, I, this is my, con I, I'm convinced this way. The first person you hear about sex from is the one that has the greatest impact upon you. The first person that talks about drugs with your children has the best. So why not talk about these things? They're important. And by the way, do you know this? Guess what? I got a little secret for you. You know God created sex? Yeah. And he's the guy that put the nerve endings where they, did, where they are. He's the, God is the God that makes it pleasurable. God's the God that gives it the euphoria with sex. He made it. So, you know, it's not a surprise to that. It doesn't, he doesn't blush about it. Oh, gee, we're going to make sex now. Guys, get out of the room. We're going to make sex. No. He said, I'm going to design this to help couples that are married to have a close relationship. And so today we're going to talk about that. Now, uh, very interesting. I was reading the last several weeks doing some research for today, and I'm reading about a survey that happened out in uh, 2012. And the prevailing attitude in our culture today, by the way, if you don't know this already, it's just sex, people often say. In a recent survey, 29% of people said they'd had sex on a first date, 29%. Men have the average of 20 sexual partners in a lifetime. Well, women have around six, but that's beginning to change. 11 million adults said they visit adult-only websites in a typical week. 65% of teenagers have had sex by the time they finished high school. Almost four in 10 babies in the United States is born out of the lock of, of wedlock, marriage. And have you heard about the hooking up culture? I, I didn't know what it was several years ago. I, I thought hooking up, for example, we, we got this building hooked up with electricity. I had no idea. Well, hooking up culture basically means sex without relationship. So in other words, you just, uh, and, and teenagers are doing this today. It's, called, it's almost like the 1970s with the adults. It's called hooking up. I'm going to hook up with this person. So you have sex with that relationship. You don't have to worry about sending flowers. You don't have to worry about all the emotional stuff. It's just sex. No big deal. I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to have this relationship with this person, and it's one night only. Who cares? It's like everyone's a rock star now. You know? It's like you know, the, that's the, kind of the, the mentality that's going on today. And things are going on in school buses and behind when parents are at work coming home from 2 to 4 o'clock. A lot of stuff takes place. When mom and dad are still at work or their guardians are at work. Kids are at home, and they're watching these videos. And I mean, there's things on television now. There's these programs that there's dating shows with naked people. And that's on regular television. 
And a matter of fact, I don't know if you're aware of this fact, but there's been a book that was written three years ago. And over 100 million copies of this particular book has been written, and it's pornographic and deals with abusive sex. It's a woman's book. And about, most men don't read it, but 100 million books. That's a lot of books. And it's been accepted. A lot of people read it. Well, I just want to spice up my, my marital life. And people are being told about this book. And you've probably heard about this 50, you know, the 50 thing. Yeah, okay. They're coming out with a movie. And it's like a, it's like a phenomena. It's, and I always, always copy cut uh, authors. My wife and I were listening uh, to Focus on the Family a little while ago, and they had a special program about it and talking about how women in the church are reading this. It's just, it's just what? And, you know, and this stuff is basically this pornographic trash. And it really helps train people to do the wrong thing. So we see this happening today, hookup culture and all that. People say, hey, man, it's just sex. Get over it. What's the big deal? Why do you want to suppress what comes so naturally? Hey, you know, I'm born this way. I, I got to have my sex, and so I'm going to have sex, so don't stop me. It's no big deal. And, and people say, how dare you say you can't have sex before you get married? You guys are so prude. Get with the program. You Christian people, you're against everything. And that's often the purva- um, prevailing culture. And we even have greeting cards for people in adultery. You know they have had that now? I was reading it, doing research. And this is what I found out. Some of the places in Hallmark and different places, they have a section that says this, love expressions and intimacy. And there's card messages. One of the creators of this said this. The founder says it launched these uh, secret lover collection. Says, well, they need to express their emotions. And, uh, and this is what it, some of their cards say. I used to look forward to the weekends, but since we have But since we've met, they seem like an eternity. And for the holidays, as we each celebrate with our families, I'll be thinking of you. Wink. So, I mean, there's almost like this culture right now about that. So it's become very pervasive in our society today. And sex has been talked about, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, I'll say it again, that they've done a study, um, Pew Research, done a study that all the television, and we're not talking about movies, not talking about uh, even cable television. I'm talking about regular broadcast television. Out of all the sexual comments and relationships on television, 90% of sexual interaction, not even, not, they're not necessarily showing anything, but they're talking about sex or they're involved with sex or it's a sex joke, whatever. 90% of the sexual content on television is outside the bonds of marriage. 90%. So everyone's talking about it. You drive by the road, you see it. You hear it on the radio, you hear about it. Sex is everywhere. And so we need to talk about this at the church. God designed it. Why not find out the right way for it? It's not evil. It's wonderful in the proper context. Right now, there's a tremendous drought in in California. Three years, no rain. And there's there's wild forest fires destroying acres of land and putting houses and whole towns in jeopardy. And, you know, fire is a wonderful thing in a fireplace. But without the proper context, it's destructive. And sex is is a very destructive thing out of the proper context. In fact, it's one of the worst sins. Why is it one of the worst sins? Oh, come on. We're going to show you today why sexual sins are worse than other sins. It's not just sex. There's consequences with it. So, what's going on here? Well, those two prevailing... Let's go ahead and read the first verse today. We'll be spending the majority of our time in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. This is what it says. Flee sexual immorality. Now, when it says flee... It's like the house is on fire. Let's get out of here now. It's flee means run with all you have. It doesn't like leave the house. No, flee. And uh, it's very interesting that Joseph in the book of Genesis, when Potiphar, if you remember the story, Potiphar's wife, Joseph was a great man of God, uh, tried to have sex with this guy. He said, come lay down with me. He says, no, I can't do it. And you know what he did? He said, okay, let's, let's, let's sit down and have a cup of coffee together. It's really inappropriate for us to have this relationship. I find you very attractive, and I wish I could have a relationship with you. But it's not really proper. So why don't we do this? Why don't we just avoid seeing each other? No, he didn't do that. What did he did? He ran. He fled. He fled so fast, he left his jacket behind. Why? Because Joseph knows. It's, that's a hard issue to deal with. You want, I mean, it's difficult. If you're in a situation with sex, you need to run. Why? It's very enticing. Why? It involves so much of your internal being, which we'll talk about again in a few moments. Why is, it, why is it worse than other sins? Why is it worse? And this very interesting, back in Paul's days, 
uh, the same type of stuff was going on. Come on, Paul, it's just sex. Get over it. There was two prevailing views. The Roman Greco culture back in the time of Paul. One view was a, a Plato view, uh, platonic. Have you heard platonic relationships? That comes from Plato. Not Plato. Plato. <laughs> Kids are like, yeah, I can be in this sermon after all. Talk about Plato. <laughs> um, but what was the deal? What do they believe? Well, let's take a look and see what, what they said. And one of the view was this. The Apostle Paul talked about this. And one is this. The Plato view said this. The body is bad. The soul is good. Sex has to do with the body. Therefore, sex always drags you down. It's always kind of dirty. It pulls you away, and spiritually minded people will have little to do with it as possible. That's a platonic view of sex. And it sounds a lot like what I've heard from some churches through the period of time, right? Sex is dirty. Don't talk about sex. I don't care about sex. And unfortunately, it's given a negative, negative thing. So if you can't talk about it in church, then where are you going to hear about it? You're going to talk about people don't, don't know the proper context. Is it any wonder why people choose the wrong way? We should talk about great sex in church. In fact, I want to be known as Cornerstone, the church that has great sex. <laughs> we need to fill this building. So whatever I have to do, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just, no, I'm not. I'm just kidding. But the history of culture of sex uh, is two philosophies. One's a platonic view. The second one is the pagan view. And what's the pagan view? I'll go ahead and read with the pagan. This is, the, this is what they would say. Look, when you get hungry, what do you do? You eat. When you get sexy, you sex. Of course, just like food, it's an appetite. Of course, when you have some control of your appetite, you, you can eat too much. And uh, you have some control of it. But when you fall in love with somebody, you feel the appetite to have sex. So do it. Anything else is repressive and unhealthy. In fact, you can cause psychological damage if you do not give in yourself about having sex. So we should encourage sexual expression. Of course, we might be responsible about it, but it's okay to have sex. It's great. You know, these Puritan people, these people. And by the way, Puritans, you know who Puritans are? You ever hear of the Puritans and the Pilgrims and all those guys? I didn't know this. I found this out in the last several weeks. I found out those guys had great sex. Yeah, the Puritans. Because I was reading an article about a, a gentleman that was doing research on him. He was reading the writings of the Puritans, and it was really graphic. In fact, uh, one guy tried to, uh, at Yale Divinity School, he tried to write a paper on this and publish it. They refused to publish it. It was too scandalous. Do you know there's a book in the Bible that talks all about sex between a husband and wife? You ever hear of it? The Song of Psalms? Your breasts are like two fawns. I will climb up the hill and pick up the grapes. He wasn't talking about grapes. Okay? He's talking about stuff, okay? And I will drink of your love all night long. It wasn't Lionel Richie that made it up. All night long. No, it was in the Song of Solomon. <laughs> Lionel Richie, you know, we should sue him for that reason. Sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. I had no idea what that meant when I was a kid. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I'm having too much fun. Let me stop. All right. But uh, it's a pagan view. And so you had the pagan view and you had the platonic view. But there's something else about sex I didn't understand back in those days. Uh, when you were in Corniff, it was a pretty bad place. It was, it was Las Vegas uh, times two or three. Uh, what they had, they had the goddess of Diana that was there in, in Corinth. And what you would do when you went to church, you would go to your church, the temple of Diana, and you would sacrifice meat to that, ask her to bless your crops, this and the other. And then what you would do during a religious rite, you would then get a prostitute that was called a temple prostitute. And so, okay, guys, we just had our offering. Now it's time for the temple prostitutes. All right, come on. And then you would go to a room and have sex. And you would do contentions about religious things. And while you were having sex, you would do a religious experience. This was commonplace back then. So, I mean, it's not that, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty graphic. That's what was going on. So that was, there was a spiritual element of it. So the question is this, why are sexual sins worse than other sins? Why is it against the body? Why does it hurt you? The Bible says every other sin is outside the body, but he who sec sins sexually hurts him or herself. It actually does damage to an individual. Why does the Bible say that? And by the way, it didn't say sex. It says sexual sin, really, which is sex outside of marriage. 
And by the way, I'm going to give you a little road map where we're going. Next week, we'll talk about sex and marriage and sex being signal. How's that supposed to work? Find out next week. And then the third week, we're going to talk about homosexuality. What does God say about homosexuality? What does the Bible say about homosexuality? How do you deal with same-sex attraction if someone's caught in that? How do they get free from it? What does the Bible have to say about it? It's not going to be a hate speech. We're not going to, you know, throw one to the curb. We're just going to say what the Bible has to say. That's controversial. Well, guess what? We need to talk about these things. But you know why? It's, we're constantly, every single day, being told a whole bunch of stuff. What, what does the Word of God say? We believe the Word of God is the Word of God. We believe that God is our designer. We believe this is our owner's manual. He designed you. He knows what's best for you. You're designed by God for God. Until you understand that, you're going to hurt yourself and other people. You're designed by God for God. He understands what he's supposed to do. You don't put diesel fuel in the gasoline engine. You just don't do that. Why? Because you'll seize the engine. You've got to put oil in your, ga- in your engine, and you'll seize your engine as well. God tells us these things because he cares about us. He's designed us. He knows what's best for us. So you don't throw a hair dryer into a bathtub. I always have to laugh when I see that. What moron is going to blow dry their hair in the bathtub? Apparently so much must have, someone must have done it uh, because that's why they put it on there. I mean, you don't do stuff like that. Well, that's hate speech. It's not hate speech. It's smart. And you're going to have a permanent perm. You don't want to do that. I just have to laugh. You know, it's, uh, you know I'm sitting there and you hear these signs like, no kidding. But apparently people don't know better. And God tells us these things for our own good. He's not a killjoy. He designs. You don't understand God made sex up. He designed the parts. He designed the nerve endings. He designed the emotional stimulation. He designed all the romantic feelings. You lost that loving. He did did all that stuff. He made it all. Okay, you're going to see in a minute what I'm talking about. And by the way, do you realize this? That that, um, sex in marriage is a sign of what's going to happen in heaven. Now, that's weird, Pastor. You're telling me we're going to be parties in heaven like that? No, I'm not suggesting there's going to be parties in heaven like that. But what I'm saying is, the closest relationship we have on planet Earth, think about it, is when a man and woman come together sexually in a marriage. That's a close relationship in its proper context. Not only are you sharing physically, now emotionally and spiritually. And the Bible is saying that close relationship pales in comparison how God wants to be with his church. And not, not some kind of gross sexual thing. It's just basically showing God wants to have greater intimacy with you than you could have in a marriage in the proper context. For example, if, if we were to talk to a, a baby in the womb, I often use this example, and we're talking to the baby and it has an umbilical cord, and somehow we were able to communicate. How do you feel? Oh, I feel well fed. My mom is giving me a lot of nutrition. Well, let me explain to you what it's like to have a ribeye steak, <laughs> surf and turf. I mean, try to explain to a, a baby in a mother's womb what it's like to have steak and shrimp. Now, if you're a vegetarian, I'm sorry. We'll pray for you after the service. But what is a baby going to know about that? Nothing. And so on this earth, it's pale in comparison to what God has for us. It's a wonderful thing that God's created. So why is it bad? So to help us through this process, I think it's always a good idea to open the Bible. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, I was also reading uh, an article called Sexual Atheism. I'm like, what on earth is sexual atheism? Well, simply, that article was simply about this in research. They have found that predominantly many people in the church believe in God, but they don't believe in God has anything to do with sex. So they're going to do what they want to do, sleep with who they want to sleep with, get involved with what they want to get involved with. So... By the way, God forgives. You know, it's okay. You do what you want. God forgives. You know, after all, I'm only human. You know, it's, it's okay. And by the way, I used to hear this when I was a kid, a uh, young teenager, and also in college. People used to say this to me. Well, the Bible says, Jesus said this, if you look at lust at a woman, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Okay, this, can you hear the logic? So we said, okay, if we've already committed adultery, you might as well go out and have sex. So I did it in my mind already, so I might as well have sex. So how, how dare you tell me I'm being wrong for doing that? Because you thought about it. You know you have. Okay, have. Okay, you have. So what's wrong with me, God, roommate? What's wrong with me going in the car and, 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 you know, doing that action with that person? What's wrong with me doing that? He, he, you did it in your mind. It's the same thing. Let me just make it something very, very clear to you. Sin is sin. All sin separates us from God. That's absolutely true. And if you have, and Jesus wasn't mincing words. However, there are collateral damages. There are subsequent damages and um, bigger messes to clean up as a result of making moral choices like that. If you're lusting in your heart, it affects you. But if you're having, sleeping with somebody 
outside of marriage, what happens? Your relationship gets messed up. You, you know, you get all kind of arguments that ha- begins to happen. Uh, I've, I've talked to people, and, and, uh, and they said, you know, I don't know what happened to me, but uh, my, my wife and I are married. No one in this church, let me make it clear, I'm not going to break confidentiality here on Sunday morning. But I remember talking to somebody one time, and said, you know, I was driving home, and they played this song on the radio. And that particular song on the radio was when I lost my keys, if you know what I mean. Okay, that's when I lost my uh, sexual purity. And so uh, I was going home today, and I heard that song, and it brought me back to where I was. Isn't it amazing how music does that? Music and also smelling different smells. It's amazing how it just transports you. So the person goes back, and they had a hard time for several weeks afterwards because they had it. And they're Christians. They love God. But there's consequences to that. There's consequences to sex. There's, 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 there's diseases. There's emotional turmoil. Why do you think so many antidepressants are being uh, subscribed to people? Why? Is it prescribed to people. Why? Is it because, by the way, it doesn't mean you're bad if you take antidepressants. The people that have high blood pressure, don't get me wrong. But behavior affects your health. Why is there so much? You know what the most violent thing that happens? Most murderers are not some guy driving by and shooting at a, someone's house. Not gang related. Most murders and most violence is domestic. Why? Because of infidelity and all that kind of stuff. It's amazing. There's consequences for this type of action. So let's continue to read what the Bible has to say, uh, starting at um, 1 Corinthians 6, starting at verse 9. I'm going to read to you. Do you not know that the unrighteous, in other words, not doing the right thing, will not inherit? The kingdom of God. And I'll inherit. You ever heard of an inheritance? Usually an inheritance means something you'll get later on. So do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Does that mean heaven? Listen, the different schools of thought. How many people want to play with that? I don't. If you want to say eternal security, whatever you want to say, um, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Means I will not inherit the kingdom of God later on. Uh, what, does that mean when I die or here? I don't know. I don't know about you, but I don't want to play around with that. So the Bible says, very clear. Do not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Hey, man, just do what I want to do. God will forgive me. It's okay. Hey, man, it's okay. Neither fornicators, that means having sex out of marriage, nor idolaters worshiping idols. And we have that today. Come on, we have idols called materialism. Nor adulterers, sleeping with someone that's not your, uh, not your spouse. Nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous. What does covenants mean? I want, I want to have what that person has. I wish I had that boat. I wish I had that house. Oh, man, it's a real kid. And you have that covetous in your heart, jealousy and all that. Nor drunkenness. Not drinking, but getting drunk, getting stoned, getting, getting drunk out of your mind, okay? Nor revilers. Nor extortioners, you know, bribing people, trying to control circumstances, will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, isn't it interesting how the church often just forgets those other ones and just talks about the ones that they had no trouble with? All of them you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I have a funny feeling. Maybe, maybe I'm the only one. I have a funny feeling that everyone in this room today and listening has a problem with one of those things I just mentioned. Covetousness, revilers. I mean, I think everyone in this room struggles with one of those things. Guys, we're broken people. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a saint with a sin problem. We all have areas we've got to clean up in our lives. So we really don't have a high on moral ground to be sitting there going, ah, look at that. We don't have the ability to do that. Now, Jesus, by the way, he was really hard on the church people. He didn't like religion. You know, religion didn't control people. He was really cool to people outside the church because they don't know better. But the people in the church, he was tough on them. Apostle Paul's talking to the church here. And what does he say here? Fornic- with the whole list there. Nor thieves or covenants or drunkenness. Listen to this. I love verse 11. And such were some of you, but, I love the word but sometimes, (laughs) but you were washed, clean, you were washed, but you were sanctified. You know what sanctified means? If you ever go to a dentist's office, they use a dental instrument to clean your teeth and all that's kind of gross, right? What they do is they put that in an autoclave and they heat it up and they sterilize it so it can be used again with no germs. Well, the word sanctified has that same meaning. God sanctifies us, even if we have a bad past. Isn't that good to know? Sanctified, but you were justified. And justified is just as you've never sinned before. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by his spirit 
our God. That's so great to know that if you've had a past, if you were promiscuous as a child or as a teenager or even whatever, uh, and, and even if you were um, committed adults or what have you, understand that God can and will forgive you if you confess your sins to him and turn away from it. He'll forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. But, 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 there's still collateral damage you have to deal with. God will forgive you, but people are not so gracious. Your ex-spouse or your kids that don't want to talk to you more are not going to be so gracious. The emotional baggage associated with that, you're going to have to work that stuff out. God will help you, but sometimes he delivers you right away. I'm not going to work that stuff out. There's consequences for sin. The King David committed adultery with Bathsheba and killed her husband. Um, Uriah the Hittite, what happened? For the rest of his life, there was a sword in his house. Yet the Masonic line, Jesus comes through the line of David. God loved him. David's a man after my own heart, but there were consequences. Do you see that? So please understand that there are still consequences. And so as we continue to look on the scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought into the power of any of them. Verse 13, food, foods for the stomach and stomachs for foods, but God will destroy both and in them. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Let me explain what that means. When the Bible says, food's for the stomach and stomach's for food, that was a saying back in Corinth of the day. Hey, man, you hungry, you eat. You got a scratch, you got an itch, you scratch it. No big deal, man. What happens in the body doesn't affect the spirit. And the Apostle Paul saying, that's not true. It does affect the your spirit it affects the very core of who you are, he says through there. And he says here, now the body is not for sexual morality. In other words, the body, our bodies are not designed for multiple sex partners. It, it, it isn't made that way. It's designed for one man, one woman, one lifetime. That's hateful. It's not hateful. That's the design. Hello, it, it just take kids together and, and show the, and, and put blocks. And you can see design is that way. What about people don't? Listen, there's brokenness in the world today. Things go wrong. But clearly, the original intent and design was not for that. You're, you're speaking hateful. I'm not speaking hateful. Listen, we've got brokenness in our lives. You know, God made us to be happy. God made us to be healthy, right? But how many of us have sickness in our lives? How many of us struggle with various things? Of course, we live in an imperfect world. We're broken people. And just because your struggle is not someone else's struggle doesn't mean it's less of a struggle for someone else. So that's another time we'll talk about that. So the Bible says, and God, uh, and now the body is for not designed for sexual immorality. Well, I mean, you, you're not designed to, why are sexual diseases? You're not supposed to have multiple partners. It doesn't work, okay? Emotionally, you're not made to do that. And verse 14, and God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Verse 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute or harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined with a harlot, listen to this, is one in body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. Quoting Genesis chapter 2. The two become one flesh, that has the connotation of glue. The Greek word, where we get the word glue, is like taking two people and becoming one flesh. I have a guitar. I love guitars and, and, and all that kind of thing. And, and I look at my guitar. My guitar has two pieces of wood. And what they do, they take and they cut them out of, um, I think it's curly maple. And they take these two pieces of wood, and they also have um, both sides. And they glue them, put a vise on them. And they glue them together. And it'd be all these pieces of wood, about four pieces of wood, become one piece of wood by putting a vise and glue. Now, if I try to separate that, you know what happens? If I pull this thing together, you know what happens? There's wood shards on this side, and there's wood shards on this side. You leave a piece of the other part as any other person. When you join sexually with somebody, you become one with them, not just physically, but mentally and spiritually. So when you pull apart, there's a, there's a chunk missing in you. You ever, heard of, ever hear the phrase, I'm going to get myself some peace? You know what, that, that's, that's probably true. You are doing that. You're getting a piece of somebody else. They're getting a piece of you. And part of you, is, and what happens is that puzzle, when you get in another relationship now, you get all the scar tissue. And so now when you're trying to join together with somebody else, there's, it doesn't connect right away. Why? Because you got scar tissue. 
But through forgiveness in God, you can clean that out and get the right context. You see, it's damaging to you. God loves us. He made sex. He wants us to have good experiences. He wants us to enjoy sex and marriage. But sin puts scar tissue and destroys your ability or makes it very, very difficult at the very least. And the Bible says right here in verse 15, do you know you know bodies are members of Christ? Shall I take the members of Christ and make the members of a harlot? Surely not. Do you not know that he who is joined with a harlot is one body with her? For the two shall become one flesh. Verse 17. But he who is, listen to this, but he who is joined to, uh, to the Lord is of one spirit of him. We're talking about sexual intercourse, talking about sexual union with a woman, man, and right after he's comparing it to Jesus in his church. Now that's weird, but it doesn't mean it that way. What he means is the closeness that we have with God. There's a spiritual bonding that takes place. That spiritual bonding happens when you have intercourse or have sexual contact with somebody else. There's consequences for it, both good and bad. I hate to talk about all the negative, but this is important we understand what the Bible has to say because next week we're going to talk about sex and marriage and sex being single, and we'll talk about that next week. So I'm trying to teach you for next week. Okay, um, so the Bible says right here, verse 18, flee sexual immorality, our first verse today we read. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against their own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and your life is not your own. You're not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. Well, I don't like that very much. You're telling me I gave my life to Christ and I'm not my, my own anymore? Yes. I'll tell you what, I'm not going to serve the devil, and I'm not going to serve God. I'm going to kind of walk between and choose what I want to do. I'm sorry, it's impossible. What do you mean that's impossible? Because the original sin from Satan when he left heaven. He said, I will make myself like the most high God. I'm going to call the shots and decide what I'm going to do. The problem is, you and I are not designed to call the shots. I don't know if you realize that. We're designed to be in partnership with God. We're designed to be connected to God. In fact, if you're not connected to God, you're going to do damage to yourself and other people. Why? Because you're made in the image of God, and you only work properly with God. There's a vacuum in you if you don't have it. We are designed spiritually to be with God. If we're not, then we're going to work for ourselves. If you're not with God, you're with the enemy. Bob Dylan got it right for a period of time. You don't serve somebody, you know, either God or the devil. And I'm not the guy with the pitchfork and the red horns, no. I'm talking about a fallen angel with legions of demons that is out there today. The beheadings we're seeing, that's demonic. Make no mistake about it. That's what we're talking about. There are real evil forces out there. And so there's a consequence for partnering with that. And the Bible says right here, for you're bought with a price, glorify God in your body. You're not your own. Now, I wanted to uh, close with you at this time to share with you uh, Dr. Jack Hayford, who is someone I really admire, uh, wrote an article, a book called Fatal Attractions. And in that book, he talked about the, why sexual sins are worse, and he gave 10 reasons. I'm just, rather than me try to repack, I'm just going to share them with you because it's, it's good, and I agree with it 100%, 100%, and it goes with Scripture. First reason, why are sexual sins worse? I'll tell you why, and then we'll talk about how to get free. Number one, sex sins disdain the root of the individual's basic point of identity. Sexual sins, you're called a male or female. Well, those improper sex deals and breaks your very formation of who you are sexually which is the core of who you are. Not sex, but sexually. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, it's a boy, it's a girl, that type of thing. Number two, sex sin exploits the deepest aspects of our emotional because sex actively awakens our deepest passions. So you have that in the wrong way. The core of your sexual, of your emotions is now being utilized in the wrong way, which does damage to your psyche. Three, sex Sins pollute the fountainhead of our highest creativity. Let me ask you a question. Uh, what do we call sex? We call it procreation. Why do we call it procreation? Because you're creating something. Procreation. Man, husband and wife get together, what happens? They can have children. Now, that's not the only reason God designed sex. He designed it to bring us closer together, a husband and wife. But procreation, what happens? It's a spiritual act that takes place. Creative process takes place. 
God's creative. So a husband and wife get together. There's a potential for a spiritual bond. Why is it in those pagan temples they had, they do the contentions, and then they would have sex? Because there's a procreation in it. What does the enemy want to do? Kill life. So procreation is a creative act which is spiritual. Okay? So that's another reason why. Number four, sex sin produces guilt that cripples confidence and authority. No other sin produces the dimension of guilt and condemnation. Think about it. Man, that person. You know, the Bible says in the book of uh, Song of Solomon, it says met about four or five times, do not awaken love to the right time. Do not awaken love to the right time. And I, I hope my kids understand this. That as, you know, I encourage people, don't get involved with all these relationships. Be friends for a while. Because once you get involved with someone, I'm not even talking about sex. I'm talking about you get, you get connected with someone emotionally. You put the sex in there, it's even worse. You're really connected. Then you pull apart. And then and, and by the time you meet your spouse, you're like, I got four or five partners already. I mean, do you want that? No. So much better to wait and find the right one that God has for you. And then become one. That's the right way to do it. And Sandra and I, that's what we did. We, we, were, we were pure through our relationship. We were friends. When, you could be with us through our whole courtship, our whole dating process. We did nothing that we could not have people around us. Why? We wanted to honor God in our bodies and our minds. So it does that. Sex things does that. Number six, sex sin exposes us to the risk of begetting an unsupported human being. In other words, you have children without a wedlock. You know, there's consequences for that. It's not the best scenario. Number seven, sex increases the probability of multiplying the spread of disease. Hello, can we see not see trillions of dollars are being spent because of sexual? Think about the problem of AIDS and STDs. I mean, who needs all that, right? It's terrible. People suffering as a result. Why? We're not designed to do the things. We're not designed for multiple sex partners. We're designed for one man, one woman, one lifetime. That's the ultimate way that God has designed sex. And sex... Number eight, sex gives the place to appetites which only beget further unnatural behavior. Think about it. It's really amazing. When you have sex improperly, you're trying to get something out of something. It all is about your satisfaction. And perfect, perfect segue there. That's really. Anyhow, so you have. <laughs> last ever the same thing happened. So when you have, for example, um, when you take drugs, and not anyone takes drugs here, you know, a heroin addict, you start off with a little heroin, you get high, and now you need to use more heroin to get the same high, you have to go higher and higher. It's the same thing as sex. Sexual sin, it gets boring. Then you need to act out. Then you're bored with that. You get to try something else, and you start getting to these crazy sexual practices, and you never get the right high. That's why these people do these crazy, diabolical, and horrible things. You know what I'm talking about? You see it in society today. But, Conversely, in the other way, if you do it like God does it. It's so interesting. I, I, I went to uh, Evangel University from undergrad. We had a professor named Mr. Edwards, and, and uh, he shared a story about him and his wife. He was an older man at the time. And I don't know if he's still around. But you know what he said to us? I know, I know it sounds funny. He said, on a wedding night, him and his wife were virgins and all that. They got married. And on their wedding night, when they consummated the marriage, guess what they were doing? They were praying. Oh, hallelujah, Lord Jesus, we love you. And, and, and they spoke in their spiritual language while they were having intimacy. You guys, less service was up in war. You guys like, so what? We do that every night. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but they were worshiping God while they were having that. Uh, that that's, oh, stop it. Oh, don't do that. I don't, what? God designed it. It's like, oh, great, it's functioned the way I designed. It can be a sexual experience. It can be your spiritual experience in the right context. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. More, Lord, more. You know. <laughs> well, I mean, God made it, right? Now I got you. Okay. Um, I'm going to embarrass my parents if they're watching, but uh, they've said it. And I'm sorry, Mom and Dad, I'm gonna, you're not here, so I can get away with it. Uh, my parents have been married 55 years. My dad's 79 years old. My mother's a much younger than my dad by decades. Okay, you know, I'm not telling the truth. But anyhow, that's beside the point. But you know what they said to us? They said to us, they said, our sex life is better now than it has ever been in our whole life. First of all, it grosses me out like you wouldn't believe. But the second part is like, that's amazing. Are you telling me that you become a better? He said, uh, we're becoming better lovers because we know how each other think emotionally, spiritually, 
and physically. And as a result of that, they had the best sex they've ever had in their lives. Why? It's deeper. It's stronger. You see, you do it God's way, the sex gets better. You do it the enemy's way, it gets worse. It doesn't satisfy you. You see, all the crazy nonsense people are doing. It's insane. We, people have lost their minds. You know, bestiality and all that kind of stuff. It's in the Bible, folks. This stuff, if you go that direction, you get crazy. It's because in the right context, it gets better and better and better. Can I tell you a little secret today? I like sex with my wife. I do. It's wonderful. Woo! Yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> Whew. Any babysitters here? Okay. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's call it, let's just get rid of this sermon right now. Let's get going. No, seriously, I mean, yeah, I enjoy it. And, and, it, and it, it's some, you know what? It's right. It's the right thing. It helps our relationships. It brings us closer together. Or it can bring us apart. Sex, God designed sex. Christians should have the best sex of anybody in the world. We're going to change the name of our church to Cornerstone, the best sex ever. Number 10. <clears throat> Number 9. <clears throat> <laughs> Sex sin breaches trust with the body of Christ. Think about it. If I'm living in a moral lifestyle and I see you, how you doing? Fine. I, I got secrets. Don't you hate having junk that you don't want to share with somebody else? Got this nagging feeling. I, I got to lie about this. I got this sexual sin I got going on. I can't live clean with somebody. I can't live clean with my spouse. And you, your spouse looking at you. How you doing? Good. You know, you want to turn off the lights because you want to see it in your eyes. Why? Because you, you've been looking at pornography or you're involved with another relationship and, and you're, you feel ashamed. Who wants that? Why not live free? No secrets. Oh, no secrets. We're getting a pure life together. We're working together. And finally, number 10, sex sin assaults the pure lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. Guys, listen. Sex is spiritual. It's physical. It's emotional. And yes, it's social. It affects all those areas. God designed sex. He made sex pleasurable. He made it a wonderful gift for humanity. For between a husband and a wife. Let's utilize it in its proper context. Because a great sex life in a marriage helps any other area of your relationship because it holds you together. It reminds you of the covenant relationship that you have with God, which we'll show about next week. And it makes you stronger as a person. And by the way, it isn't everything of your life, but it's an important part of your life that you've got to get right. And so I pray that this church, we will get that right. And I, you know, I, what about if you make great mistakes and I, I've had a really bad past and I, I'm really... Uh, just struggling with this. I wrote this down, and this is true. The world regards all the emphasis it places on sex. It has a low view of sex, doesn't it? It's cheap. Christians have a higher view of sex than our secular culture, followers of Jesus Christ. So what do you do if you've messed up? Or what do you do if you're messing up right now? I don't need to be a prophet to figure that out. Then a group of people, are going to be people struggling with this area. What do you do about that? I got good news for you. First of all is this. We're not called to do this by ourselves. And if you're trying to live a pure life without God, good luck. We need God in our lives. Why? He's our designer. He's our creator. He knows the best way for us to live. And he gives us in the person of the Holy Spirit to help us walk the right way. So today we can walk away here. Maybe you've, you've had a past. Maybe you've committed adultery. Maybe you're involved with sexual sin right now. My friends, get it in the light. Get it in the light. Maybe you're struggling. We want to have, maybe have groups of guys and girls get together, guys and gals get together and, and uh, separate from each other and pray for each other and help each other. Keep each other accountable. Whatever is a secret controls you. Get us off in the light. It's wonderful with trusted friends and people that really care about you. God wants you whole and pure. He doesn't want you to live in this miserable life like that. And so I just want to encourage you that the Bible says there's no condemnation for those in Jesus Christ. And I was reading the other, I was reading the other day about um, Corinthians. Talks about godly sorrow brings repentance, but condemnation brings death. 
Condemnation and conviction are close and how they look, but they're vitally different. If you sense right now, oh man, I screwed up, I'm a jerk, I'm a loser, I'm also throwing the chips, that's not of God. But if you think, man, I really hurt God, I gotta get this right. God's saying, okay, I love you, I'll make you right. There's no condemnation for those in Christ. God wants to heal your relationships. He wants to heal your marriage. He wants to heal your body. He wants to heal your family. So why not embrace that? If you're feeling like, oh, I can't do it. That's not of God. If you feel, you messed up. Now get up. Let's make this right. That's of God. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is through Jesus Christ. So how are you doing this morning? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Well, I believe in Jesus, so what? The devil believes in Jesus. You see, being a believer in Jesus Christ and a follower of Christ does not mean you believe in him only. It means you've surrendered your life to him and say, God, you're in charge. So I want to pray a prayer right now. I'm going to ask the ushers to make their way up. We're going to conclude quickly here with the communion. This is an opportunity for us to come to the table of the Lord, one of the greatest things you could do in antiquity in the time of Christ when you accepted somebody one of the things you would do is you go to their house and eat it's just a culture thing to show you have accepted someone and, and what Jesus is doing is he tells his church and us today, listen I'm pulling up a chair, I want to sit down and eat with you guys, behold I send the door and knock, if anyone opens the door I will come in and dine with him God wants to have a relationship with us that's so close so intimate so fulfilling ever growing forever so I'm going to pray a prayer with you right now if you want to pray in the quietness of your heart a surrendering prayer to Jesus Christ Lord Jesus I thank you for dying on the cross I believe you are the son of God I thank you for dying on the cross and taking the place of my sin I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins both known and unknown I want to share some things that are on your heart right now. Maybe some sins that you're struggling with. Father, I confess these sins. I've been wrong. I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. I thank you that you've forgiven me. And by your help, I will live for you for the remaining of my days. You are now the boss. You are now the commander of my life. I step aside from the driver's seat and I say, God, you are in charge of my life. In Jesus' name prayed that prayer and meant it, you've begun the journey to be a believer in Christ, to become a disciple of Christ. If you prayed that prayer, we have a card that we can just fill that card out. I prayed that prayer. You can come up and pray, and pray with one of us afterwards. But that's the beginning. Now, another thing, the Bible says this. This is my body, Jesus says, which was broken for you. What heals us is the love of Jesus Christ. So, Father, I ask right now as we take this bread, as we break it in our mouth, we thank you your body was broken, that we would be whole. Father, I pray for healing right now over people's past. I break the power of condemnation. I thank you that there's no condemnation for those in Christ. Thank you for who the Son has set free is free indeed. And if we confess our sins, we shall be free. And so, Father, I just pray right now, people that have a past, that are ashamed of, we thank you that your blood, your broken body covers. Take eat this in my body, which is broken for you. After they had dinner, they had a cup, the last cup. What washes away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. Take, drink. Let's all stand at this time, please. It's all about forgiveness, folks. That's what it's all about. God forgives you. You need to forgive yourself. I'm going to ask some of the prayer team to make their way up. And we're going to have one concluding song. And if you want to go to uh, 101, we're going to start at... Uh, one o'clock. You're welcome to have lunch with us if you want to find out more about our church. We've got some space for you.